All right. Well, thank you everyone for coming tonight. Um, for those of you who don't know, my name is Eric Potty. I'm the manager of programming with the Airdrie Public Library. Um, and we're really thrilled to welcome you to our second um, writing workshop with our writer in residence, Simon Rose. Um, before we get underway, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of the Blackfoot in the People of the Tree Seven region in Southern Alberta in the Métis Region 3. Uh, this includes the Siksika, the Pekani, the Ghani, Sutina, and the Stony Nakoda First Nations, including Chickeny, Bears Paw, and Wesley First Nation. In acknowledging the traditional territories of the People of the Tree Seven region, we are giving recognition to the fact that uh, this is their traditional lands, and while a shared home now, our ancestors were in fact guests and not owners. Um, I'm going to forego uh, Simon's biography just because we did that uh, last week. So if anyone is looking, it is on our website or you can watch last week's video if you would like that has been put up on our website um, and you can take a look if you need a refresher on writing for publication. Um, like I said, we're very excited to, to be able to offer this tonight. Um, Simon's going to talk to us about um, writing for, for children and for YA audiences. Um, so I think it'll be a lot of great information in here. Um, but as I always say, we're not here to listen to the library in Yammer. Um, so I will replace it with Simon and he'll take it away. Okay, well, thank you very much. Uh, for, uh, there was no introduction from the from the official library gentleman. But for those of you who were here last week, I'm afraid I am going to tell uh, you who I am and what I've done a little bit for the people who weren't here last week. So if you've heard it before, my apologies. But my name is Simon Rose and I have written, uh, we're going to be talking about writing for children and young adult audiences uh, this week, or I am anyway, and there'll be some time for questions later on. But uh, the, uh, these are the, so th this is the age group that I've written uh, 15 novels for. Uh, and I've got another three uh, novels, a new novel series is coming out uh, in the new year. Uh, also for the uh, sort of young adult audiences. Uh, I've also written eight guides for writers on the various topics, uh, one of which is, well, two actually, are about writing for children and young adults, but also there's uh, some writer's guides on uh, writing for social media. There's one about um, uh, doing workshops and things in schools and things like that. I did a book on that, and there's one on writing historical fiction and time travel stories. I've also written about 120 non-fiction books for a variety of publishers on a variety of topics, um, which again, all on my website, if you're interested in finding out more. Um, despite doing stuff just for um, uh, writing books and things, mainly for uh, children and young adults, uh, I do do editing and coaching and mentoring and things in all genres for all age groups. I also do some corporate work and write websites and articles and blog posts for companies and things. And I'm currently teaching uh, creative writing at the University of Calgary, an online course, but I've also done stuff at Mount Royal before and with uh, the CBE, uh, adult education as well. So after that, uh, hopefully brief introduction. Uh, there's limited time tonight, of course, as there always is, to go over this very complex and, uh, and uh, large topic. And I'm mostly going to be focusing on uh, fiction, uh, but we hopefully will be also able to answer a few questions about uh, non-fiction and things at the end. And if anyone's got any questions about different age ranges uh, for uh, books for younger readers and things like that. I'm mostly going to be talking about middle grade books, uh, which are from, I suppose, ages nine to 12, that sort of age group, uh, and also about young adult, which is uh, strictly speaking, I suppose, bit ages 12 to 14, that sort of thing. But there's no real hard and fast rules on that I've always found over the years. It really does depend on the uh, on the reading level of the uh, of the children. Sometimes there are some some nine year olds that will read books. That, uh, that are meant for, for much older children. And there's also 14-year-olds uh, who, aren't, who aren't reading at that sort of uh, higher level either. So it does all, it's, all, it's all very dependent on that, really. Um, so as I say, no real hard and fast rules about this, but there are a few things that I've come across over the years that I can point out for sure. Um, one of the first things uh, to note is if you're writing for this age range, 9 to 12, 12 to 14, that sort of uh, area. Uh, writing older is one of the things that I uh, came across quite early on. And what this meant to me was that um, if, um, if, your if your readers are uh, probably um, 
uh, nine, ten years old. The, the main characters in the book um, that, that are uh, the children characters anyway, the young characters, should be uh, um, the same age or older, preferably probably a little bit older than the kids uh, who are reading the books. Um, it's just that they, 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 they seem to have uh, be able to identify more with them uh, in some ways. It, it, they don't really want to read books that are about children that are um, uh, younger than them. They'll probably see them as being for, you know, for, for little kids and things like that. Just like, a, you know, somebody who's usually reading books for um, that are meant for 12 to 14 year olds aren't going to be reading picture books very often. So that's one of the things I found out early on that if you if you if your readers are going to be about um, 13 or 14, then your main character should be about that age or slightly, um, slightly older. Um, one of the other things, one of the other rules that I have always told people about as well is uh, realistic settings in these stories for children too. And I, I'm going to be sort of returning to this theme a little bit uh, again during this little talk uh, in that um, even though the books are for children or for younger readers, you, it, it, it's not wise and you really shouldn't be cutting corners and things with the, with certain parts of the story and the plot and everything and the characters and everything, just because uh, these books are for younger uh, readers. Um, it has to be realistic and things have to be plausible as well. You just not, just because they're for children, it doesn't mean you can you can skimp on that. Um, in For example, this uh, this book here, in this one here, uh, this was the first book that I uh, published. This is all about a, a kid who travels in time through um, uh, through the frames of paintings in a museum. Um, and it's uh, I had to work out just for it, well for myself and for the readers, I suppose, just how this uh, how this all uh, uh, operated, how the time travel method actually worked. Even if it was fictional, I had to work out uh, in my own mind so I could explain this to the reader exactly how this. Um, uh, how this uh, how this worked out it was the same thing with my um uh second one here which is about uh, the sorcerer's letterbox uh say, same age. these are both books by the way for for the younger age range i suppose for the nine to twelve uh with this one it involves a um he's ex the main character is exchanging letters um through time with one of the princes in the tower in the tower of london at the end of the wars of the roses and things but one of the and he does travel in time at some point there's a wheel on top of the box that he can turn to travel in time and everything but one of the things that had to be realistic about it was because he wasn't just uh, doing something in the present day and then going back in time and having his adventure and going back home safely again. This uh, this box, this letter box, is 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 something that he carries around with him uh, in the story. So I had to be very specific how uh, uh, about the size of that. It's not a, a sort of box that he can fit um, inside a pocket, for example. But he does need to be able to ha carry this thing around with him, say. Uh, and, and so it couldn't be, I had to be specific on the size and how it worked and things like that. The um, third uh, one I put out, just, I'm not gonna talk about all the books here, <laughs> but this one here is all about cloning evil, evil scientists, secret experiments and laboratories and this kind of stuff. Uh, but again, I had to be very specific in my own mind and to explain this to the reader as well. It had to seem realistic and plausible exactly how the, uh, the imaginary, uh, scientific procedure actually worked, so I had to work that out as well and make sure it was um, uh, it was uh, it was realistic. And one thing I should mention on, in that one as well is you've got to also be able to describe, say, the setting of say say for that one with the um, uh, with the uh, 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 the cloning uh, evil scientists and that kind of stuff. It, you have to be able to explain, um, even though the, even though the readers may be familiar from uh, from TV and movies and and books, and of course from their own personal experiences, they they know what um, laboratories and hospitals and these sort of things actually look like. But you've still got to be able to describe it. Uh, you've got to be able to describe it realistically as well. So uh, even, it, again, just because it's for children, it doesn't mean that you can uh, you can uh, skimp on the details there. Another thing to, to consider when you're writing books for uh, uh, for younger readers as well is that the children have to be the uh, have to be the heroes of the story uh, and uh, work out all the things themselves. You can have adults in the story. In fact, sometimes it's quite essential to have children, uh, adults in the story um, as characters. But of course, adults can do things. Um, 
some things anyway, that children can't do. They can drive, they have credit cards, they can book airline tickets, and they're, of course, bigger and, and, and have a greater strength than children and this sort of thing. And it would be very tempting for them to solve all the problems for the children and decide on them um, and, 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 and uh, bring everything to a satisfactory conclusion and, uh, without the children really having much of an impact on that. Um, but it's important that the kids uh, are there to solve all, most of the things themselves and be the heroes of the story. Um, I know that uh, in the clone one, for example, I, and in, in fact, even in the one about the paintings, that I have adult characters in those books because sometimes it's necessary for an adult character to um, uh, explain some very important detail or something like that, or, or to get, so that so the, uh, the, the the young character can gain access in the first one, has, has to be able to gain access to, um, a museum at night, for example, which they wouldn't be able to do on their own without some help from an adult. But the adult is just there for, for to serve that purpose, uh, and the kids are the ones that um, that solve the problems themselves. Um, one of the other things I've noticed too in my own travels through this uh, wonderful journey through the writing world uh, is. Uh, so that the kids can be able to relate to the story and relate to the characters um, it is important as well. And that may seem difficult if you're writing things like I am about uh, time travel and other dimensions and parallel worlds and, and science fiction stuff and everything. It might seem difficult to, um, to be able to do that. But if the story is set in the, um, at least partially in the present day, the one I did about the cloning was takes place in the present day uh, uh, as it was then when it came out in, 2005 I think uh, but even the ones about time travel uh, they, they usually the story takes place at the beginning it's in the present day and everything like that um, the, the characters are going to have amazing adventures in time or in space or an alien planet or something like that perhaps but they also uh, the main characters can also have uh, things that, uh, that the reader will be familiar with they've got overdue um overdue homework projects they've got parents they've got siblings they might have pets um they, uh, they 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 own a bike or whatever it may be it's stuff that although the although it is a novel it is fiction they know it's a story if the character has some of those things going on in their life then uh, the reader is going to be able to uh, identify with the characters uh, a lot more and then they're going to of course hopefully be able to enjoy the book more and, and buy more of your work uh, all being well. Um, we mentioned a sort of no hard and fast rules earlier about um, kids books and everything and it's the similar thing with um, uh, word counts, uh, how long a book, how long a book should be uh, and things like that. Obviously a book for uh, middle grade readers or a book for young adult readers is going to have more pages and more words than uh, a picture book for younger readers, uh, naturally, and it's going to have less words uh, than, than, than some, you know, big novel series for adults and things like that. But um, for me, it's mostly been about uh, 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 the pacing of the story, I suppose, really. I've always tried to uh, uh, start with a very dramatic beginning to really hook the reader and drag them in um, uh, in the first chapter. Sometimes it's only been... Uh, might only have been like a prologue or something like that at the beginning, but it's definitely something that I've always done at the beginning of the stories anyway, to uh, to hook the reader and drag them in and to have the reader think um, or to say to themselves, what on earth is going on, but in a good way. So that they, not that they want to put the thing down and think, oh, I'll never want to read any more. You don't want them to do that, of course, but you want them to what you want them to think, well, I need to know what's going on in this story and what's happening with this character. And so I need to go on to, to the next chapter, the chapter two. Um, in, the, in the chapters themselves, uh, I usually have cliffhanger endings at, uh, uh, at the end of each chapter uh, for the same purpose, uh, really, so that the, the reader will want to, uh, they'll either be mildly intrigued as to what's going on uh, and want to read the next chapter, or they'll, they'll simply have to turn the page to, uh, to find out what's going on. Um, when I've been writing, uh, uh, the, well, the latest series especially, uh, which is about, um, it's a historical fiction story about the uh, English Civil War. 
Um, that one has cliffhanger endings at the end of each chapter, as I've just mentioned, but also um, there's a cliffhanger ending at the end of the first book and at the end of the second book, uh, because the purpose of that is to, of course, get uh, the reader to um, to want to read the, uh, the, the the next books in the series as well. So uh, not particularly um, strict rules uh, are, are about uh, books for those age ranges, I suppose, but there's certainly some of the things that I do um, in the course of my own uh, uh, of my own writing. Now, some of this uh, I may have mentioned uh, uh, last week when we were talking about writing for publication. But for those who weren't here last week, uh, uh, I have to mention some of these things. Um, the same principles, uh, really, that uh, that apply to adult books do apply to books for children in some areas. Uh, even though, again, it's a younger readership, it, you can't really uh, t take shortcuts. Um, historical research is one of those, even though it's for uh, for, for for younger readers. Um, uh, I've done, as I say, the time travel stories and also historical fiction. And um, uh, I don't even if even if the characters that you've invented are not taking part in events in a certain time period, uh, the, the events in the time period have to be uh, accurately depicted, even if they're only taking place in the background or if somebody's arriving and telling somebody what's happened in some uh, in some battle or you know, or something like that that actually did happen. I know I was once at a, uh, at an event and a, and, a, and a parent was considering buying one of the books. I can't remember which one they were uh, considering at the time, but they were asking me if the um, events in, and the history was accurately depicted in the story because they didn't want their uh, their child to be reading some uh, historical. Uh, even, even if it was a time travel story, if it wasn't uh, accurately depicted and the history was uh, giving them uh, wrong information. So um, that was important as well. Um, if you've got a historical period depicted in the book, the dialogue has to be appropriate for the era. I think that seems obvious to me, but for some people, sometimes it uh, it, it isn't. Um, uh, if you've got a story that's set... Um, uh, in in the medieval period, for example, you can't have people wandering around using words like uh, OK, for example, which because it, it, it wouldn't have existed back then. Uh, the dialogue has to be appropriate for the era, if it's, especially if it's the characters that are actually were existing in the era, as opposed to, say, a time traveler from 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 the present. Uh, same thing with names, too. Uh, if you've got stories set in the Middle Ages, you've got to make sure or the Middle Ages or World War Two or the Victorian era or something like that. Again, even if it's for younger readers, the names have to be appropriate to the um, to the time period. Same thing, too, with the with the plausibility of the of a historical story, even if it's for, for kids. Um, clearly, people can't go around carrying uh, um uh, cell phones in ancient Rome and things like that. You can't have anachronisms like that. That's reasonably obvious. Uh, but also, uh, not just from a technology point of view, um, you, ha you have to carefully consider, even in a kid's book, that, uh, uh, that uh, uh, say, uh, certain political views about uh, democracy and everybody uh, being able to vote for their government or something wasn't always something that people would be thinking about uh, in, in, in certain historical um, time periods. Um, I know when I was doing my um, medieval book um, a novel that was set in the time of the Black Death in the mid uh, 14th century, uh, I had to be uh, uh, very um, careful and make sure everything was accurately depicted regarding the status of, of, uh, of women in that particular time period, uh, whether they were in the um, uh, upper levels of society in the aristocracy or, or, or elsewhere. Um, so that was that was an important thing to consider, even though it was a book for, uh, for say, 12 year olds. Um, same thing with science fiction stories, uh, as I mentioned earlier with the um, with the clone book and everything. Even if it's imaginary technology, it has to be plausible. It has to be seen to work. Um, and uh, when I was doing more uh, in-person visits in uh, in schools and things like that, I would sometimes be asked questions as to how this particular time travel method worked, or how these people, uh, this this cloning technology worked, and things. And I had to have a uh, I had to have an answer in my own head as to how this imaginary technology worked and everything like that. Same thing with fantasy worlds and uh, and magic as well has to be uh, seen to make sense. 
And of course, the plot has to make sense as well. It, it, has, it has to be, you can't just have things coming out of nowhere um, uh, it, it, that don't make sense. The plot has to make sense um, throughout, throughout the story. Now, th and the main reason for this is, and I think I might have mentioned this last week, one of, the main re one of the main reasons for all this is that although the books are written for children and teenagers, the reviews are not done by, well, they might be, a few of them might be done by children, but the vast majority of the reviews of your book for this age range are going to be uh, done by adults. They're going to be teachers, they're going to be librarians, they're going to be professional book reviewers, uh, and these things will be reviewed and uh, the review will be on Amazon. Uh, for good or bad, and if if you have some uh, historical anachronism or something that's not plausible, or you're using a character name that isn't doesn't fit with the time period, uh, they may or may not mention that. But if they do mention that, it will it will it could have a, have a really detrimental effect on the on the book and on your uh, reputation, perhaps as an author. So it just it's be careful uh, that uh, you get all these things right and adhere to these principles, I suppose. Uh, we did mention uh, last week uh, briefly uh, about, um, uh, of course, you have to have an idea for a story, obviously. Uh, you have the idea first, then you start writing the story. And ideas come from up here. They come from your imagination. They come from in your head. And they get there from, uh, uh, from books, from TV shows, from movies, uh, from online. I've had uh, some story ideas from dreams and not the... Um, entire story maybe sometimes just the premise i guess from a dream but it's uh, it's another one of those things you can do history with me being a, a history major and a degree in history and everything i've always had an interest in history as well i'll watch history stuff on 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 tv and movies and things as well so that's been certainly been a, a source of inspiration for me for kids books and also from everyday life you can just get ideas sometimes from uh, from uh, when you're grocery shopping, when you're out in the car, or when you're walking the dog, or ideas can come from uh, you know from just about anywhere. Um, sometimes the uh, the author sometimes might just think to themselves, well, what if you know, what if this could happen, or what if that could happen? For example, what if um, one day you uh, you went home uh, after work or school or something like that, and in your mailbox you found a mysterious scroll. And when you opened it, it was inviting you to attend a school for wizards. Well, whether that's where the idea of Harry Potter came from uh, or not, I have no idea, but that's that's one example of that. Or what if you, um, what if a flying boy dressed all in green uh, appeared at your bedroom window and invited you to travel off to a magical land like in Peter Pan? Or if you wandered into the back of your closet and, and wandered into, into another universe like they do in The Lion, the Witch and the Wardrobe, or you followed a white rabbit um, across a field and it went down a hole and you followed it into another, into another dimension. Ideas can come from just about anywhere. I know with um, the one about the paintings for me, um, the first uh, 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 premise, the first idea of that was I, I think I was just thinking about, well, what if... Um, what, what if somebody, uh, what if, uh, that was it, it was what if the portrait was haunted by the ghost of the person it was painted of? And this was one of the first ideas I ever had. And I thought, that's, that's, that's good. And I thought, that's good. And if that's been done before, that's a good idea. But then I, I thought quite soon afterwards, I thought, well, what if the person was actually trapped in the painting by an evil spell, by an evil wizard or something like that? And then after that, the a character from the story would 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 try and uh, help the person escape from the painting. Um, but then it was like, oh, OK, well, I, so that's not much of a story. If he finds out that somebody's trapped in the painting and then uh, goes uh, maybe goes into the painting and helps to free this person. But then it, after that, it all came tumbling out all at once, I suppose, out of my imagination. If they could get get in, if they could step into the painting from the outside and they could step through the painting from the inside to escape, uh, then could they do the traveling in, in time thing? And, um, and I had to keep a lot of this stuff uh, uh, um, in mind, like I was mentioning earlier, about keeping it realistic. Um, uh, I had to work out the entire time travel method and how, uh, how people couldn't see this character moving around inside the frame when they were when they were looking at the painting from the outside and of course they couldn't the characters couldn't travel 
back in time to before the painting was created. They couldn't go back in time to the painting, say, to, to, you know, to, to visit the dinosaur era or anything like that, because the painting existed since, I think, the year 1665 or something like that. So they couldn't go even go to the year before. All that was important, um, important to consider. Um, the one about the uh, princes in the tower was basically inspired by that, by the two boys who were supposedly murdered by King Richard III in 1483. Um, uh, this one was inspired by, and uh, this this one here, the Emerald Curse, came out in 2006. This one was all about um, a boy who has adventures inside his own superhero comic book collection. Um, and this was inspired by my own uh, reading of comic books, Marvel comics, DC comics, superhero stuff uh, when I was uh, uh, younger and into my early uh, 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 ch childhood, I suppose, and into my early teens. And then I uh, took I took it up again uh, in the early 80s briefly as well. And uh, and in that one, yeah, it was that was that was inspired by that. Um, the one about the Black Death was, again, my. Uh, my my background in history i suppose um and then there was uh, there was some of these as well this one here this the idea for this one shadow zone about a parallel universe um that is in da in danger of being destroyed by environmental catastrophe and a deadly virus and we didn't have a deadly virus in the real world when this was first thought about a long time ago when it first came out in 2017 but the idea for that was that somebody from the uh, the parallel uh, world was um, was sending a cry for help to somebody in our world, and he would go into this other universe. That was the basic premise for that. Um, and this one, which was the um, this is about the paranormal and everything. The idea for this one was about uh, reincarnation and previous lives and things like that, and how people. Um, are supposed to be able to access somebody's previous uh, memories and previous life through hypnotic regression and things, and um, that was um, uh, that was that's I, that was the main idea for for that one, and then that that again led to, uh, like the, the one about the parallel universe led to three books, and the one about the paranormal also eventually was three books uh, too. Um, now, one thing I had mentioned last week uh, for those who were here was um, how we should always keep our ideas and how we used to, uh, I suppose in the old days, we'd keep stuff in a, um, we'd keep stuff in a, a journal or a notebook or something like that. And now more often we'll keep them in a, a document in the computer or something like that in a folder and things. Um, I just wanted to mention that one again briefly, that again briefly, because some of these ideas, uh, I only had the, um, the first part of the story, like with this one about the parallel universe, I had the idea that he would be contacted by somebody from this other universe, but I didn't have anything beyond that. And that sat around for quite some time. It was one of the first ideas I ever had. And then it sat around until 2017. The paranormal one was much the same. Um, I thought, well, he's going to go back into somebody else's life through uh, uh, hypnotic regression and, and 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 prevent something from happening but i didn't know what else was was going on beyond that and uh, and then of course where's this one oh yes here it is this one this was one i talked mentioned briefly last week with this one in the sphere of septimus here another very early idea that i had from my own uh uh story uh, notions and things in my career and with that one that, that it was all about a character visiting the most mysterious um the most mysterious village in england that had the most legends and mythology attached to it than anywhere else um and when he was there he discovered a portal to another world and that's all i had i didn't know where he was going to go what the other world was like or anything but eventually i got um i i got the rest of it same thing with the uh, the one that's just about to come out about the about the civil war was much the same i had um an idea of what the story was about and when I wanted to set it, but uh, it sat around for quite a while. So um, you should always keep your ideas because you never know when you're going to get another piece of the puzzle, I guess. Um, I had talked about um, editing and revision last week, but I should mention that as well, uh, because this is a, a very, very important part of the writing process. It is it is part of the writing process. You can't deny it, really. Um, uh, I actually now this is one thing that I do have here, if you don't mind me just reaching over here. If we were doing this live, I would be able to <laughs> one moment. 
I would be able to show you this in real life, but this basically is, this is the uh, original manuscript edited for my first novel from 2001. And it includes all the, um, all the notes from the editors and, uh, and things like that in here as well. I used to take this with me to, uh, to, to, to classes and things and pass it around for people to look at. It's a fascinating thing. I had sent this to the publisher in the mail and got it back in the mail because this it was that sort of time period. Now everything's done with track changes and, and all that sort of stuff. But even though, again, the book was for a younger audience, uh, editing was very, very important to get everything right before this, this book was ever you know let out into the world so that people could read it. Um, the editing and revision part of the process is even more important if you're going to be self-publishing, because if you actually get um, your book into the hands of a traditional publisher, uh, they're going to have an edit editing people who'll be looking at it and everything like that. If you're self-publishing, uh, a lot of that is uh, stuff that you're doing yourself or you're hiring someone to do it for you. And then, but you're going to be making sort of final checks and things like that. Um, I um, tend to, edit as I go along. I do a final edit, of course, before when it's all done, but you, you, some people prefer to do, write the whole thing and then uh, edit it at the end. Uh, I tend to do it as I go along. Sometimes it's one chapter I'll do after I've written it. Sometimes it's two or three, but I'll tend to do it um, as I go along. And a, a piece of advice I would probably always give to people, even for kids' books, is don't be afraid to revise the thing. Um, uh, it never, in my uh, um, experience, if you're editing your uh, book, it, it never seems to get any worse. Uh, it must be getting better, but it doesn't get any worse if you're editing it. Um, I have an outline now for the books. I didn't for the first one, as I mentioned, I think, in, in the class last week. Um, I uh, usually create about... Uh, a, uh, a short paragraph for every chapter of the book. Um, it does change as I go along. Sometimes it changes substantially, but never, never completely. Sometimes it's just that last, uh, that third quarter of the story that might be changing a bit uh, when you need to be sort of wrapping a lot of things up so that the ending makes sense uh, and things like that. Um, but uh, I, I, and and. I've, I've found though that it has helped help me. Dis, it's helped me to stay on track, and it's helped me as I as I've said before. I think it's helped me as well. If I've got an outline, I, I've been able to get away from this computer and away from uh, from my home office and go out to a coffee shop or something away away from distractions and have the outline with me and work on a particular section of the story. It doesn't need to be a whole chapter. It might be a uh, uh, an action sequence or something in one of the chapters that I've got to work on and I'm not, I don't seem to be making any progress at home but if I've got the outline I can take it with me uh, to a different um, uh, a different location now of course you can decide if uh, if you if you want to it's entirely up to you it's not the law of course that you have to edit and revise your book uh, uh, you can certainly choose not to do that if you want to or you can uh, choose to do it poorly as some people have done in the past um, there are a few examples I would like just to read out to you here that did actually make it out into the real world uh, because somebody didn't check them over properly. And they, most of them, all of them, in fact, do sound quite plausible. They do sound uh, as if, as if uh, we, we know what the author's trying to say, uh, but they've not really been looked at properly, whether, whether it's for, uh, for grammar or punctuation or just, just not checking it over. The first one I, I always remember is, it was a story about a young girl who lived uh, uh, near, the, uh, near the ocean and her family had uh, gone away and, uh, and, 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 and she was missing them very much and everything. And every day she went down to the shoreline, stared out to sea, hoping that the boat uh, would be bringing her family back again. And the line in the book uh, said that, um, uh, she ran down the beach and cast her eyes out to sea, which, of course, we know what the author is trying to say. She's going down the beach. She's peering out onto the horizon to see if the boat's coming home. But it does sound as if she actually took her eyes out of her head and threw them into the sea, which obviously is not what the author meant at all. Um, another one I always remember was a, a story about uh, it was set during a soccer game and the um, the line in the book sounds perfectly plausible when you when you read it, but then you look at it a second time and you realize it's a bit silly when uh, 
Uh, it says he was about to score when he lost his head and kicked it into the crowd, which again, we know what they're getting at, uh, but it does sound like his head fell off and was kicked into the crowd at the soccer stadium. Uh, another one was all about, um, it was a sign, I think. Yes, it was a sign that was at the gateway entrance to a safari park, which is like a zoo that you drive around in your own car to look at uh, animals and things like that. And this warning sign was at the front entrance and it said, uh, <coughs> excuse me, it said, um, elephants, please stay in your car. Now, they'd obviously missed some punctuation there because they're trying to tell us that the uh, the elephants are dangerous. So don't get out of your car. You could get hurt. But it does sound like they're asking all the um, all the visitors that are elephants to remain in their car, which is, you know, which is not obviously what they meant. And the last one I always remember is uh, uh, the soldiers were close enough to see their enemies eating their lunch through binoculars. And again, we know what the author's probably trying to get at there, but it sounds plainly ridiculous when it's not been checked over properly. So um, if you want to uh, not edit your work and, and put it out there by not checking it over, by all means, I suppose you can do so because other people obviously have done in the past. I should mention as a final point here in this thing, because I don't have run out of time, is um, <coughs> sometimes people will tell you when you're writing, even for kids, they'll tell you that you should uh, write. Uh, they say, oh, it's all about writing what you know. Now, if, if you're somebody like me who writes about science fiction and fantasy and time travel and other dimensions and parallel worlds and things, that might seem like a bit of a tall order because these things are all very much in the... Um, in the imaginary world, I suppose. But it doesn't always mean that particularly. Uh, it means that if, if you're writing about something that you know about, if, you're, if it's uh, a historical period that you're uh, uh, quite fond of and you want to you know a lot about it and everything, it's the, the whole project that you're doing is going to seem a lot less like work if it's if it's a historical period that you're uh, that you that you're keen on learning more about or indeed you might already know quite a lot about um i've certainly had to write uh, about some historical periods that are not um as popular with me perhaps sometimes and i've done non-fiction work and things like that um but as i say if it's, if you're writing about things that you know uh, it, it makes it seem it, the whole process is a lot more fun and things as well um if you're just um trying to write something I suppose that's popular or you're following trends and things like that and it's something stuff that you don't know it is going to seem a lot more like work and a, a lot less of a fun uh, uh, a, a fun process now on the other on the other hand of course it doesn't mean that if you live uh, in uh, in western Canada uh, it, it, it doesn't mean that you can't write a story that's set uh, you know, in New York City or in Los Angeles or in or in Europe or in or in, or in Asia or Australia or something as well because you can you obviously can do that just as same as you can uh, write a story that's set in a different time period to the one that um, that you live in so when somebody talks about writing what you know don't get confused too much about that uh, in thinking well I can't write about um, I've never traveled into into uh, in, into the depths of the galaxy on a on a on a on a faster than light spaceship, so I can't write a story about it. Well, yes, you, yes, you can. And if it's and if it's something that you're um, uh, familiar with or one of your favorite topics, is going to seem a lot more fun. That's for sure. Um, as I said, it's hard to cover everything in uh, in in such a short time. So I am going to be open for questions when we're uh, when we're done here. We've got some time for that. Um, you are welcome to contact me um, throughout the uh, time that I'm the uh, writer in residence with the with the public library and also afterwards as well when this is over and done with at the end of the month. Uh, you can contact me directly. You can contact me and connect with me through um, uh, social media and things as well. So um, yeah, I'll uh, so thank you in advance. Thank you for uh, um, for being here this evening. I hope uh, I've been able to shed some light on some things about writing for children and young adults. And maybe I will be seeing um, some more of you, uh, some of you uh, again soon. So I'll hand it back to uh, to Eric, who can uh, uh, take it from there.